afternoon. Um, if any of you are in the uh, opening addresses, you'd be pleased to know that when people started talking about stories, I was really pleased because I actually want to tell you a story today about the biggest archaeological project ever undertaken in the UK. And it starts with a decision to build a railway, a high-speed railway. And the first part of our story is a section from the West Midlands and London, and the second section from the West Midlands to Leeds and Manchester. So the story is, as we already know, in two key parts. Check in around about 2033, and then we can all find out together how it ends. I might be retired by then. Fingers crossed. So we're going to stay on the first phase. That's the 143-mile section, London, West Midlands. So chapter one of the story, if you like. And we've begun to, to write that chapter. Uh, we have a beginning, quite a good beginning, I think. I've been on the project four years now. I must have done something. And we know the ultimate ending of that first phase, 2026, an opening operational railway. And we are currently in that really tricky middle section where we're trying to work out how the story evolves. And doubtless there'll be some unexpected twists along the way, like all good stories. And so in the beginning, as one of the best books says, we, um, we have a different planning narrative for the scheme. Uh, we build it with a hybrid Act of Parliament, and that is just entering the final stage in the House of Lords, due for royal assent at the end of this year, fingers crossed. So what has this got to do with national frameworks? Well, we are a national infrastructure project, and following on from our last speaker, a new fact I learnt is that we are, the project will require the largest acquisition of land since the Second World War. So from an archaeological perspective, it's exciting, it's daunting. We have the Secretary of State's commitment to deliver, which is enshrined in the Heritage Memorandum. And for those of you involved in the project in this room, I can see many familiar faces, um, read the Heritage Memorandum. That is the Secretary, commit, Secretary of State's commitment to Parliament that the project will do the right thing uh, by the historic environment. And that is the one thing that actually keeps me awake at night. And the project runs diagonally across our landscape. This is some geophysics and LIDAR that we've done near Birmingham or rather on the outskirts, a place called Coles Hill. And we need to understand our landscape effectively, intelligently and efficiently. Oh, and to pro uh, program and budget, which is key considerations for any project, any business, any venture. You all operate in this sphere, no matter who you work for. So let's look at the title of the story. This is our overall project design vision. It's not my um, historic, not for the historic environment. It's the project vision. But that's us, isn't it? We're all here because we're interested in the past, telling stories, as we heard earlier today, about people across time. Um, and that's what I want to do. I want to tell the story of what we'll uncover for High Speed Two. Now, in realising that vision. Our country, uh, company mantra is innovation and collaboration. It's woven into all our contracts, it's into all our documentation, and it is expected. And our country, uh, company strapline is to be a catalyst for growth. Now, wouldn't that be really great if we could realise that, growing the historic environment collaboratively and innovatively? <coughs> We need a plan, like all good enterprises, or indeed a series of plans, specifications, strategies, guidance documents. And this is a similar slide to what our last speaker showed, all the interactions that we have. And you will realise this is not actually complete. Some of the arrows could go in different places. And what this gives you a slight flavour for are the many interactions. The red arrows are direct links into HS2. And all the blue arrows are all the other relationships that can happen that I can't control. And those of you that know me know that I'm probably a little bit of a control freak. But 
We do spend a lot of time talking to non-governmental organisations, petitioners, line of root communities, uh, supply chain, Historic England, local planning authorities, the wider industry, interested, the interested public. Because we recognise that we can't do this project in isolation. So we've engaged, consulted, collaborated across the profession. And all of this is to de deliver the Secretary of State's commitment. I need to be able to prove to Parliament, ultimately, that we've done what he promised. But also this means that in this time of austerity, we have a project that is progressing. And therefore that does mean that I, I have a budget. We're able to fund Historic England with a service level agreement in recognition of the burden that we place on their advice and in recognition of the expertise that we need across them, whether it's talking to them about museums or science or archives, the whole gamut. The project as a whole also funds local planning authorities to attend our meetings and ultimately support the project, the project as it goes forward because again we place a burden on those very fragile resources as we heard earlier. And we have a, um, a heritage subgroup that meets quarterly, at least one member's in the room today. Hello Anna. Um, and that, that group has been going for four years which involves conservation officers, county archaeologists, a range of historic England people who meet on a route-wide basis to guide and help our thinking. We have some very interesting and robust discussions, as you might imagine. We're also able to host events and seek your views and opinions. Again, I know that some of you in the room have been to our workshops so that we can understand how you deal with your digital recording techniques, um, how you know, what should we do about the archive problems and museums? Sorry, challenges. We don't talk about problems. Um, we've also had a whole series of workshops to help deliver our historic environment and research and delivery strategy and talk to many of you about the skills and capacity issue. So this is where a lot of the talking most recently has got us to. Um, its, it's full Sunday title is the Generic Written Scheme of Investigation, Historic Environment Research and Delivery Strategy, which abbreviates to HERDS, and as archaeologists, herding cats, it's what we do on a regular basis. And these concepts uh, on the screen there are not particularly revolutionary to you. We have client commitments to deliver, Secretary of State. We're all about enhancing knowledge. We need to provide a legacy skills, training, archives, resources, the story. We have a programme and a budget. All of us in this room have programmes and budgets. And we also want to deliver public benefit. Again, perhaps back to that storytelling. And these are just some of the challenges that we have. Again, these will be touched on, I'm sure, throughout the rest of the, the, the day and tomorrow and Friday. In drawing together that research strategy, which is in its uh, first draft at the moment, we've had to deal with multiple uh, fra regional frameworks. We've had to stitch things together, look at our resource assessment. What do we already know about the resource that we're going through? We have to consider concepts such as uh, local versus national. We need to manage expectations because, sorry to say, we might not solve every single issue that the industry has in this one project. We need to look at harnessing technology. What, what are our good traditions? Which ones do we want to keep? How can we innovate? How can we be more efficient? And empower our supply chain to undertake this work for us. A little bit of a process slide here. This is from our uh, HERDS document. And this is how the stitched together process is looking at the moment. The green is what we call employer controlled. That's me as the internal client. So we've established the ethos and principles of the project and headline objectives, one of which is legacy. We've set out strategy specifications and procedures because although we have lots of very good guidance documents, 
it doesn't help me explain to a contractual organisation exactly how we want them to deliver in a uniform manner. Because if we're dealing with lots of different uh, suppliers, then they're going to do it in lots of different ways. We need to try and limit that. And we set uh, specific project objectives. The blue is contractor generated, so what the supply chain will deliver to us. And that is also uh, contracting organisations, but also the other organisations that we will engage with along the way, and I'll touch on that in a moment. And then employer moderated when all that information comes in. So it's, even without looking at that, it's quite a complicated um, process. But what we want to do is create an environment for everybody to think. We want to build an enabling environment. I'm not going to specify to our contractors, dig that site exactly there like this. We don't know all the answers yet. We have a very good beginning, but we're going to be giving them blocks of land and saying, OK, we know this, we know that, we think we know that, we've got some information on that. Come back to me with all these specifications and tell me how you're going to do that in this format, please. So we're still working very much through the details. We need to know when we've got enough information, how to know when to stop. We need to also consider how our engagement is going to evolve and change. Throughout the project, we have, um, in all our wider documentation, a lot of commitments, and quite rightly so, to engage with the communities along the route, different organisations, businesses. How do local authorities help us uh, determine the submissions that we'll be making, our sort of planning applications, if you like, which are required and set out by Parliament? And, you know, what are all our checkpoints along the way so that various people know that we've delivered what we said we were going to do? And, you know, how can we make best use of the expertise of Historic England county archaeologists, conservation officers? But also, how do we meaningfully engage with academia, the non-professional uh, non but very experienced lay community? How do we get our message out to the communities along the route? Now, we have whole engagement teams along the route, and they are naturally, as Mark found out from the one show, dying to understand how we're gonna, when we're going to tell them about what's down their street. And as the last speaker has just showed, everybody is interested in archaeology. I know that. So it's just a matter of actually being able to get the message out there within the strictures of the project that we have. And so the story, I'm, and I'm very conscious of time, the story doesn't actually have uh, an ending, but we've got a really good firm beginning. And so in the words of Curtis Mayfield, we're on a music theme today, people get ready, the trains are coming. You don't need no baggage, you just get on board. Because I am very excited about this opportunity. It's a generational opportunity. And I hope that you will be with us as we continue our journey and continue our story. And so I hope you will too be on board. Thank you.